How do spiritual powers interact with the world today? I ask because I've recently read Heiser's Unseen Realm and saw your notes on Psalm 82 referencing other gods. But how does all this affect the daily life of a believer? What role does the devil play in all this? Okay, so there's several things we have to, um, at least two things that we have to note with regard to this. One is that um, the Bible allows us to talk as though um, we are up against the devil, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a form of shorthand. It's like a, it's like a soldier telling his family that he's going to Europe to fight Hitler. Mm -hmm. Well, he's never going to see Hitler. He's not, you know, mm -hmm. he's he's fighting the armies that are headed up by Hitler, but he's not fighting Hitler. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible teaches that the devil. Um, uh, um, roars around like, like a roar is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and we mm -hmm. should beware of him. But we should beware of him with the recognition that the devil probably doesn't know my name, doesn't know who I am, or where I live, because the devil is not God's opposite. Mm -hmm. um, He's not omniscient as well. Yeah, and and the problem with the shorthand form of the devil does this or the devil suggests that is sometimes we can attribute to the devil functional omniscience mm -hmm. um, when he d he's not omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent at all. So if the devil has an opposite, it would be something like Michael the Archangel, not God. God has no opposite. The, the devil is um, a fallen angel and is limited and finite. Um, we are allowed to speak of him as being the leader of the other side, the prince of, mm -hmm. prince of the power of the air. But we shouldn't attribute too much to him. That's the, that's the first thing. And we should particularly, and this leads to the second thing, the, the second thing is we should particularly not attribute too much to him given the cosmological revolution that happened in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Okay. So if you've done all the exegesis, if you read um, the Old Testament carefully, if you read Michael's, Michael Heiser's book, uh, The Unseen Realm, which is a very good book, um, you, you will see a certain angelic hierarchy that is described and assumed throughout the Old Testament. Now, it's, I think it's a, a, a fallacy, it's a fallacious assumption for us to say, and because it was that way in the time of First and Second Kings, mm -hmm. it's that way now because the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ accomplished a cosmological revolution, which is what, um, uh, which is what the whole book of Hebrews is about. Uh, so he's not subjected the world to come of which we speak to angels. So the world to come, the Christian aeon, the aeon in which we are, uh, mm. that, that we're living in, it has had a shakeup in the, um, in the, in the hierarchy, in the flow chart. Mm -hmm. So in the Old Testament, it was God, angels, man. In the New Testament era, it's God, man in Christ, angels. Mm -hmm. So there's been a, um, a, a dramatic switch. And so consequently, uh, angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to those who to inherit salvation. Uh, Galatians tells us that uh, these spirits were like servants in a big household, um, taking care of a billionaire who's a two-year-old two in a high chair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, we, have, we, in the Old Testament, mankind had not grown up to his majority. Mm -hmm. He had not come of age. And so he was under the tutelage of angels. And that was complicated by some of those angels, a good number of them being fallen and rebellious themselves. Mm -hmm. Right, some of them weren't. Michael, for example, and some of the they were good angels, but the, the whole situation was a mess, complicated. Uh, but man in Christ has now come of age. We we are now ready to enter into our inheritance, mm -hmm. and um, and that's why um, Hebrews emphasizes Psalm eight so much. What is man that you're mindful of him? You've crowned him with glory and honor. So the the ascension of Christ into the heavenly places is the event that has crowned man, mm. man in Christ. Okay, but so um, are, the, are the weapons, um, an individual's weapons for fighting against, say, the world and the flesh, 
any different than the weapons for fighting against the devil. So if somebody, if somebody is uh, working to grow in spiritual maturity and they're, they're this question mark of am I, am I working on flesh or am I working on spiritual powers against me? In mm-hmm. one sense, does it, does it make a difference based on uh, the way you're going to actually work in spiritual disciplines in your own life? N- no, I don't think it does because there's a close intersection between the world, flesh, and the devil. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and the whole thing, b- basically, this, the central thing to mortif- mortify is mm-hmm. if you're dealing in your sanctification, the central thing that cries out for mortification is uh, pride, envy, accusation. Okay, the flesh wants to accuse others. Mm -hmm. The world runs on accusation of others. And the devil is the accuser of the brethren uh, Mm -hmm. before the throne day and night. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you you made it your object to mortify the sin of a hypercritical spirit or anger, accusation, Mm -hmm. finger pointing, that sort of thing, um, I would venture to say 99 out of of 100 Christians who spent a lot of time mortifying the sin of accusation and a critical spirit and mm-hmm. envy and jealousy and stuff would be mortifying at one fell blow the world, the flesh, and the devil. Mm. Okay.